we're not quite ready yet. Um, so. Excellent. Thank you, JR. Okay, so I think we're finally ready to go. Thanks for the patience, everybody. Um, uh, we just had some technical difficulties today, but we're about to get started now. Um, so I think, Natalie, you're going to kick us off here, right? Yes. Um, so who has control of the slides? Is that Melissa? Correct. Melissa's okay. got it. Okay. That's me. Um, you, yeah. Well, welcome everybody to our first webinar of the week uh, using DSpace 7.4. Um, uh, Melissa, you can go ahead and click through. Next slide. Oh, oh there we go. Okay. Um, before we begin, I wanted to take a moment to remind the DSpace community at large that DSpace wouldn't be possible without your expertise and financial support. DSpace software is financially supported by the community via membership dues, certified partners and service providers, and various funding efforts. Current pledges and campaigns are the DSpace Development Fund, DDF, and the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, known as SCOS. If you have been enjoying the benefits of working with this open source community and software product, please consider contributing to one of our fundraising campaigns in the coming year. You can read more about them and make your financial contribution or membership commitment via the fundraising section of the DSpace website. And all those links are in the chat or in the slide here for you to check out. And I just realized I don't have my video on. Good morning, everybody. Okay, next slide. And I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce all of the presenters for today. My name is Natalie Bauer and I'm the new um, DSpace program coordinator. And I've been with the, with the DSpace community for about two months now. And um, I'm part-time and my, um, I'm really happy to be here with all of you. And today, we're first, we're going to have Melissa Anis. Uh, Melissa is an outreach and engagement coordinator at Lyricis, where she works with DSpace as a hosted service. Prior to joining Lyricis in 2020, Melissa spent many years working with open source digital repositories through the IO community. And then we also have Wanahue, and he is the technical lead for the DSpace project. He coordinates community participation in the open source development process, including helping to find roadmap and organizing development meetings. He's been a DSpace committer since 2006 and joined the DSpace project team previously at DoorSpace in 2009. He has a degree in computer science from Notre Dame and a master's in library and information science from the University of Illinois. In all, Tem has over 20 years of professional software development experience with over 15 of those in open source realm. Um, next slide. And during the presentations, if you wanna add your questions to the Q&A um, public doc, that would be great. Um, you can also um, add any questions to the chat and I can all, uh, pop those into the doc as well, but preferably, Preferably, you can add them to that document here. Um, and there's the link for you. And we will be answering questions uh, and answers at, at the end of the presentation. Thank you. All right, I guess it's my turn. Uh, so this is just a general outline of what you can expect from this workshop. Uh, for the first section, I'm going to be taking you through a very high level look at the DSpace front end and some of the basic tools and functions. You can kind of think of this as DSpace 101, like a really intro course into working with DSpace. Uh, and then once we hit the additional administrative tools section, I'm going to pass things over to Tim for a look at some of the more advanced features. And we're going to save a half hour at the end for all of your questions. So what is DSpace? Uh, it was created 20 years ago out of the open access movement uh, with a particular goal of getting research out to the world. 
Uh, the original aim was focused on text-based content, because really at the time, that's all you could expect to put into a digital repository. But over time and with additional development, it's come to expand to images, videos, audio, far beyond. Uh, and so even though you can dis restrict DSpace with access control, the underlying goal has always been to make, make research easier to discover and share. And following that very brief mission statement, we are going to dive directly into the structure of the software itself. Uh, so the basic hierarchical structure of every DSpace site is to have communities, which contain collections, which contain items. Communities cannot store items directly. In order to store an item, a community must contain at least one collection, which can then hold the items. This is a very long standing model from the very earliest days of DSpace. Uh, and conceptually, a community is an organizational unit, uh, which can have its own access control. It can be helpful to think of this as like a, a university department or a faculty as an example of what maybe a community might be used for in a DSpace site. And within that community, you can have an unlimited number of subcommunities, and each of those can have their own distinct access control. Uh, communities can also contain collections, which are able to directly house items. Conceptually, a collection is like a digital folder or a container. Each collection can have distinct workflows and access control policies of its own. And then items are the actual digital content that you want to store in DSpace. These are the documents, the images, the videos, et cetera. You can just store any kind of digital file in DSpace. It does not matter what it is. Although only certain file types are gonna be able to be displayed directly in DSpace when you visit the site. Uh, so DSpace will display things like basic images. It's got a player for video and audio files in DSpace 7. Uh, other file types that you want to display, they might have to be downloaded and viewed locally, but you can store anything digital in DSpace. So we're going to have a look at an example here of browsing through this site structure. You start on the front page and you see a list of communities. And within this physics department, I'm talking a little ahead of my pre-recorded demo here. So I'm going to let it reset. Give me a sneak peek ahead. All right, back to the top. First thing we see is all the communities in DSpace. In the physics department, we've got a couple of subcommunities for miscellaneous and for theses. In this subcommunity, we've got a collection. The collection can store actual items. It's got a bunch of photos, a bunch of digital images, and it's got a video inside. So this is the basic structure of every DSpace site. You've got communities. In order to actually store, store a digital item itself, you have to have a collection inside that community. Next, we're going to have a look at the search function of DSpace or how you discover things without having to browse directly through them. So DSpace search is powered by Solar, which provides very quick results, and it's got a nice, intuitive, faceted interface. Uh, items, collections, and communities can all show up in your search results. Uh, and it's got a really nice uh, date range slider, which you can use to narrow your search results to a certain range of dates that comes with Solar, and it's a really nice feature. Uh, and I think it's important to note that the dev team uh, kind of works with Google Scholar to make sure that DSpace remains optimized for discoverability. So if making sure that your content is going to show up in Google search, if that's a priority for you, then DSpace is built with that in mind, and we try to maintain that so that Google Scholar is always going to at least be able to find your stuff in DSpace. So this search results page shows a default set of facets, and it shows how easily you can narrow the results to a single author. I'm here, we're going to click down to Cameron Simmons and just show the search results that have him tagged as an author. We can eliminate that by just Xing out that one filter. Moment. We can use this date slider to narrow the range of dates publication here. We can get rid of unwanted filters by collapsing this away so we don't have to see them. And we can reorder our entire set of search results by changing the sort settings. So all of this is fairly intuitive, relatively user friendly. This is not an unfamiliar way of dealing with search results um, for your users. And it's all quite fast, which is a handy thing to have as well. And looking at the structure of items themselves, this is what's present on any item in DSpace. 
um, you can have files associated with an item. This is not technically required. You can configure your site to allow for items that are metadata only or that reference an external resource. Uh, I, an item is going to have a permanent URI. It may or may not have a thumbnail. Uh, depends on the type of object and your system settings and whether that's been set to generate. There's going to be a metadata display on that item. Uh, there'll be a simple display as the initial view, and then there's a more complex kind of librarian style full item display that's going to show the full metadata profile. Uh, and finally, if there is a version history for the item, that pre that version history will be displayed on the item page. So I'm going to look at an example here. This is a video file, so you can see the DSpace 7 video player in action. So there's some very simple metadata here. There's an abstract. You can see the, 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 uh, the URI. You can see the collections that this item belongs to. You can see version history here. There's one previous version of this item. And if we look at the full item page, we see the Dublin Core metadata scheme that's available by default in DSpace. Uh, but keep in mind, you can define your own custom metadata profiles if that's what you want for your site. And I'll let this play through again so you can get a look at the item page. You see also the file is there available for download. So if there wasn't a player available for this video file, we could download the video and play it locally. So that is a basic item in DSpace. But with DSpace 7, we've introduced some complexity. There are now different types of items. So what we've seen so far is standard. It's the kind of item that has been around through all the previous versions of DSpace. It's just an item. Uh, now we have something called entities. And entities are a brand new concept, new in DSpace 7. Uh, they are items that can be linked to other objects, forming complex relationships. Uh, they are entirely optional. Basic items are still the default, uh, but there are now certain entities available out of the box in DSpace 7, and you can configure your own. Uh, there's a link here on this slide to take you to some documentation for how to create your own and for how to work with the entities that come out, but I'm going to show you uh, some examples of the ones that come with DSpace 7. So out of the box, DSpace will come with entities for working with journals and research projects, kind of as two big overarching buckets of, of conceptual ideas for entities. So for journals, the predefined entities are volumes, issues, and publications or articles, uh, which can be related to each other to form kind of a structured concept of a journal publication. You put your issues inside your volumes, you put your publications inside your issues, and suddenly you have an actual journal structured within your DSpace that people can browse through like they would a, a regular pub a serial publication. Uh, research entities are more flexible still because they have the ability to create things like persons, organizational units, like a government agency or department, and research projects so that you're linking publications to the projects that created them, and you're linking the researchers who were attached to that project to the project, and you're linking them together with the organizational unit that they were working for when they were working on the project, and all of these things are in a big web that all relate back to the entire organizational structure that was surrounding this research project so that people can trace back all of these different publications to the groups and the organizations and the projects that created them. And all of this stuff is now linked together conceptually within DSpace itself. So entities are a very new concept to DSpace. They're still fairly experimental. Uh, so making optimal use of them is going to require some careful planning if you want to work with them. Uh, but there is really tremendous potential here. So we're going to have a look at journal entities in action. We're browsing through a community that contains a journal volume entity. Uh, it's linked to several journal issues here. It's got a couple of issues in it. And each of these issues has articles actually linked inside. All of these are publications. And I'm going to let this play through a couple of times so you can that go a little fast in this demo. And then each of these articles is itself an item with a full metadata profile and a PDF associated with it that you could download and read of the article.
And then each of these items themselves are, sorry, each of these entities themselves are actual full items with their own metadata profiles. Next, we're looking at an example of an organizational unit. And this is linked to some researchers. It's also linked to some research projects. And then these research projects have associated publications, they have associated researchers. All of these entities are independent items in DSpace. They all have their own metadata, they all have their own permanent URIs. They're just as much items as a video of a hamster or a research paper unto themselves. So entities are a really exciting new feature. I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what can be done with this. These are just the ones that DSpace 7 ships with. You can create your own, figure your own if these don't serve your purposes. There's a lot here and we're really just getting started. Back to something much more basic in the site structure of DSpace, we'll look at the different ways that you can log in. Uh, there are several methods that are supported from a standard direct login with a username and password stored in the site, uh, right down to systems that integrate with a number of popular single sign-on tools. So this is just a very quick demo of the standard login. This is found at the top right-hand corner of the demo site. Uh, so the bottom of this little login pop-up is also where you're going to find the options to register a new account or to recover your password of an existing account if you need those options. So just type in your username, type in your password, nothing unexpected here. This is a demonstration of log logging in with the shibboleth option. So the user is redirected out of the site to a single sign-on so that they're using credentials from an external source. Um, and this just notes here that if your service had a logo and a description or instructions in their metadata, it will be displayed there for the user. But we're using a username and password that don't belong to DSpace. They belong to, say, the university itself. We're tapping into someone else's system. The user is going to log in through that system. They're going to make some decisions about how the information is going to be passed back. And then they're redirected back to DSpace and they're logged into DSpace. Uh, and finally, in this demo, you can also use ORCID to log into DSpace. If you choose to enable this site, uh, instead of having your users have to have an account on your DSpace site, or instead of using credentials from your university, you can allow people to log in using their ORCID identification as their credentials for DSpace. So they're redirected out, they authenticate through ORCID, and then they are popped back to DSpace, authenticated into your DSpace site using the credentials from Orkin. So everything we've looked up at up until now is viewable without logging into DSpace. Uh, we're going to move now to the other side, content creation and management, where you have to be logged in and authenticated into the site. Uh, the first thing we're going to create is the most basic level of content in DSpace. We're going to create a community the top level organizational structure. Uh, so this is where you can very easily build access control. You can endlessly nest your sub communities, and collections, and you can perform curation tasks. Uh, the one thing you cannot do in a community is store items. Only collections can store items. And I know I've said that before, but I think it bears repeating. Communities are top level organizational groupings, but they don't hold stuff. They hold the stuff that holds stuff. So since I'm logged into an account with admin access, I have this admin sidebar. And our first option when we mouse over is to create a new object in DSpace. And we're gonna start with community. Um, we can browse to all the existing communities in DSpace or I can create a new top level one, which is what I'm doing. And I'm create, presented with a very simple set of fields. I can upload a logo. Uh, I can fill out all these optional information fields. Most of them accept just basic HTML. Um, since I find it helpful to think of communities as departments, I'm making a biology department. Um, and once I save, I am taken directly back to my new community. So I'm sitting in my new community. There's nothing here right now because it doesn't have any subcommunities or collections. And it's just starting over here. Create new community. I can browse where I want to put it. Create a top level community. 
very, very simple metadata form with just a handful of fields. Almost none of which are required. I believe I can get away with just giving it a name if I wanted to. And we're done. So if I repeat that process without navigating away, the system is going to assume that I want to create a sub-community, and it's going to pre-select biology department as the parent for the new community I'm going to create. I can select something else if that's not what I want to do, um, but if I do want a sub-community, then that's saving me a step. So I'm just going to go ahead and make an anatomy, an anatomy sub-community for my biology department. So if I'm creating a new community, I I'm already in biology. It's selected biology. I could have browsed away. I could have renamed a new one. I could have uh, searched my entire site for another community I wanted to put this into. Or I can just stay where I am. Next, I'm going to create my first collection. So I'll be able to store actual digital content. Just like creating a sub-community, if I go to the admin menu while I'm in the anatomy community, it's going to assume that's where I want my new collection to be. So it's going to pre-populate anatomy as the parent collection. I can browse out or I can stay inside anatomy, which is what I'm gonna do. So many of the fields in the collection creation form are very similar to the form for making a new community, but we've got two new options. Uh, towards the bottom. So I'm going to add some very quick text here. And then down at the bottom, I have the option to add a license, which will be applied to every item submitted to this collection. And I can also apply an entity type to this collection. And that's going to limit the content inside the collection to just that one entity type. So for instance, if I selected journals from that entity type list, I would only be able to create journal entities inside this collection. It would be a collection of just journal entities. When I go to create an item, the same shortcut applies. It's going to pre-select the collection I'm starting in. Um, so I'll make it in the theses. I can upload my item right away by dragging and dropping it onto the page, or I can click to browse. I'm going to upload a, 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 I'm putting this in a theses collection, but I'm going to use a photo of my son's cat in a basket because that's what I have on hand for um, test content. So this is the most complex metadata form we've encountered so far. These fields are all based off of Dublin Core. Um, only a few of them are after are required fields in this out of the box configuration, and all of this is configurable if you wanted to do your own metadata schema. So we're going to enter a few bits of metadata. We'll give it a title, be an alternate title. And this form is actually so long that it exceeds the maximum length for my little pre-recorded clip. So I'm gonna have to go to the next slide to show you the rest of filling this out. All right, so here I'm gonna use the date picker uh, to enter the created date. This is actually, this is one of the forms, the fields that's gonna to have to be filled out in order to save or deposit this item. But that's having a date picker makes it pretty easy to fill out a date. I'm gonna leave most of these fields blank because they're not really applicable for a photograph. Maybe I will tell it it's a photograph. It's an image. And I'll give it a quick abstract just so we can see how that's going to look on the item display. All right, and there's a second area here where we could upload the file if we hadn't already done so above. And this is where we can deal more directly with the file itself. Um, we'll have a little more on that later. Uh, and down here is also where we have to agree to a license in order to complete the upload. If we had specified a custom license when we created this collection, that license would appear here instead of the default license uh, that's set up for the entire site. Uh, finally, I can save my changes as they've been entered. I can save the item in a draft state to work on later, 
or I can deposit it directly, into, uh, deposit it into DSpace. So I'm going to deposit that. So if the collection had any special workflows, my item might go into a queue to be reviewed by someone else before it will be published. Uh, since there are no workflows enabled on that collection, I was put directly in. Um, we can see here there's the abstract, there's a thumbnail, the files available for download. Uh, unlike the hamster from earlier, there's no version history section because there's only one version of this item and the, it's not going to bother to display an empty section of version history when there's no data there to display. And we have the, the full item here with the full DC data. Oops, skip around. All right, and as an alternate method for creating an item, we can use the import function to pull metadata from an external source. So this is going to populate some of the fields and you can fill the rest out manually, including attaching files. This example shows importing an item from PubMed. This is just one of many, many, many external sources you can draw from. And then once we're satisfied with the data that we've entered, we can deposit this item just like one that we've created from nothing. So I'm gonna let this play through and then talk through the example once it resets. So I think it's important to know just exactly where we find this. So this is actually done under my D space, and we will explore this a little bit more again a little bit later in the demo. So under my D space, we're going to import an item, and then we pick from this list of external sources. We find PubMed, and then within this external source, we can search or the available publications that we might want to import. Find the one we're looking for, we get this little preview. And then we can start our submission. We pick the collection we want to put it into. And then we see here this create item form, mostly populated with a lot of metadata, but there are still a few fields, including some required fields that we have to fill out for ourselves. And once we've checked all that over, we can go ahead and deposit that item into DSpace. Okay, so on occasion, you may find you have items that should not be permanently accessible. Uh, embargo and lease allow you to establish at the time of deposit a date range for when an item can be viewed. Embargo is going to set a time when the item will become available, and Lease is going to do the opposite. It'll publish it immediately, but it's going to set a time when it will be taken down on a predetermined date. So to embargo an item, we're going to edit the file itself. This is that section at the bottom of the create form just above the license that I said we'd talk about later. So in here, we're actually doing metadata on the file, not the item. This is the uploaded file. Um, so we're up, we can do things like rename the, the file itself from not just being the file name. We, um, we can add a description and we can do these time-based access policies. So we can set an embargo here. It lets you pick the calendar date when the file is going to become accessible to the public. We can set a lease doing the opposite. We're picking a date when the file will no longer be accessible. You can't have both at once. So changing from embargo to lease is going to replace that embargo with a lease and overwrite it. Again, we click edit on the file itself. Pick which kind of access condition we want to put in. And it's just a nice little date picker. You can set this one to expire at the end of November and this file will be taken this file will no longer be accessible to the public at the end of November. It has a lease. The other method for access control in DSpace, instead of setting a time limit on when the file can be accessed, is to set who is allowed to access and what form that access should take. DSpace deals with access control at two levels. There's people, 
or individual user accounts, and groups, which are linked sets of users. Uh, they're grouped by their shared access level. Uh, users can be in more than one group at the same time, so they'll have different access levels in different collections or different communities, for instance. Uh, and access can be set for communities, collections, items, or even at the bitstream level. So, for example, you can restrict files and allow access to the metadata only on certain, certain collections. So to create a person in your DSpace, give someone a user account, you go to the administrative menu under access control and click on person. And here you're going to find a list of all the existing accounts on the site. Um, we can go into these accounts, perform some administrative tasks, such as editing account information. We can set a, a password reset email, or we can completely delete the account from the site. Uh, we can also see which groups the person is a member of. Back in the main person menu, there's a button to create a new account. And we just have to fill out three basic fields, two name fields and an email address. I'm creating a fake account for my son's cat, um, just as an example. So now Link has an account on the site. To create a new group, we go to that same section in the administrative menu and we select groups instead of people. And here we get a list of all the existing groups in the site. Anonymous and administrator are default groups. They're going to be there in every DSpace site. Anonymous is how your DSpace site appears to the internet at large, to anybody landing on your site if they don't have a, an account to log in. Uh, and administrator are folks who can see this handy dandy toolbar on the side. Everybody else is a custom group that we give power by granting them access to things. So, uh, Let's start from the beginning of this. So we're going to groups. Let me click the big green button to add a new group. And we have only two metadata fields to deal with. We have to name it and describe it. Uh, we don't give groups power at the time of creation. We give them power and rights based on how we assign them to collections out in the site. So I've created an editor's group, but that editor's group can't edit anything Yet, I'm going to have to actually give them edit powers in the site for them to be able to do anything meaningful. Next up, we want to add people to that group so that when we give that group powers, there will be people already populated in it who will then gain abilities on DSpace based on their membership in that group. So we need to find the group in the list and edit it. Um, luckily, we can search to narrow things down because there's five pages of pre-existing groups in here. So I'm going to find my editors. I'm going to edit them. And now I have to find e-people. That's user accounts, persons, people in my DSpace site. I'm going to find Link's account. And I'm just going to click this little plus button. And now Link is an editor. He is a member of the editor's group. And having groups and people and knowing how to add them and work with them and move them around is useful when we start getting into workflows. Um, so this is the last section I'm going to talk to you about. We're going to look at how to set up workflows. We're going to look at them um, both from the creation standpoint and working with them as a reviewer. And we'll have a look at uh, a handy little tool for cleaning up stuck workflows. So DSpace comes with three workflow roles. There's reviewers who re uh, accept and reject submissions, but they don't get to edit them. There's final editors who can only edit things. They cannot accept or reject them. And then there's editors who have the broadest set of powers. They can do all three. They can accept, reject, and they can edit the metadata of a submission that lands on their desk. So to add a workflow to an existing collection, we navigate to that collection and we click on the edit tool and then we have to assign roles. Adding administrators and submitters will restrict who can administer this collection and who can submit new items to it. Until we've added these new roles, these, role, these functions were open. Anybody with administrator power on the site could administrate this collection and anybody with a user account could submit items to it. But once I've added the submitter role, I've limited it to only people who have the submitter role on this collection. Adding reviewers, editors, or final editors is going to introduce a workflow to this collection. So until these roles were turned on, there were no workflows on this collection. It was simply submit, deposit, submit, deposit. 
until a role has at, been added, no collect, there's no workflows applied to this collection. Now that the roles have been collect created, we need to assign people or groups to them. So that there's going to be somebody to receive the work when new items have been submitted. So to assign a person or group to this role, I need to select the role I want to assign someone to. And then it's going to take me to this screen, which is very much like the screen I was on when I was assigning people and groups from the administrative tab. I need to find the group I'm looking to assign. I'm going to use the editor group. I find them from the list and add them. Um, and I can, uh, I can also assign an individual person. So if my site is small enough that I only have a handful of people working on it and my workflows could be down to like the six people on my site and I don't want to bother with groups, I can also just put link in as an editor in this workflow or as a reviewer in this workflow instead of dealing with groups. It's a bit redundant in this case because I have him in the group that is also in this workflow, but as a demonstration of how it works. Now we're going to look at workflows from the point of view of the reviewer or editor or final editor or whatever role you have to have. Uh, so this part of the workflow takes place in my D space. This is a user's personal view of the site. Uh, and this page contains a list of the user's own submissions and a list of their active work. So when you're logged in, my D space is found in the same place as the is the login. Uh, you start by viewing a list of your own submissions, but you can switch to a view of your workflow task, including those that are available for you to claim. And if I have a role that's got the ability to edit, I can go into the item and I have the option to update the metadata. So I'm looking at the basically that that create item form with the full metadata form um, before I approve or reject. And for this other item, if I decide to reject it, I can give a reason for that rejection, which is going to be shown back to the submitter when they receive their notice. And finally, near the bottom of the administrative sidebar, there's an option called Administer Workflow. Uh, and this is a tool that bypasses the regular personal workflow and accesses all items in workflows, which can be very handy if there are submitted items that have become forgotten or stalled because whoever's claimed them or whoever's responsible is maybe away, you're no longer able to complete the work and the items are just sitting there in a workflow, no longer moving. Uh, so as you see here, the administrator workflow view, it looks a lot like the MyD space view, except instead of being able to claim the items, all I can do is send them back to whoever submitted them or delete them entirely. Um, and clicking on either option is going to take me into this more detailed view of the item where I can see the full metadata. And it gives, also gives me a second chance to confirm the action I want to take. So instead of just deleting it immediately, I get to look at the full item and I say, yep, definitely want to delete this or definitely want to send this back to the submitter. So this is a, a power user view of everything that's in all workflows all actively in all workflows. And that's my bit. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Tim now to talk about all of these sections of the administrative toolbar that I didn't touch on. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Um, and before I uh, go into this section, I did want to note briefly, because I saw it come up a couple times, uh, the slides will be available right at the end of this whole webinar. We have a link to the slides on the very last slide, in fact, so you'll have them very shortly. Um, so no need to jot down tons and tons of notes. Um, you will have all of our um, slides, the canned videos, as well as all the notes that both Melissa and I have. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk to you about a couple more administrative tools. I will also note here, we're not able to cover every single feature of DSpace in one hour, which is what we tried to limit ourselves here to. We're going to cover as much as we can, but we will have uh, the webinar here doesn't close for another 45 minutes. We have a good chunk of time for your questions. If there's features we haven't covered, if there's questions that pop up, we can try and answer those a little bit more uh, in a live fashion. Uh, but go ahead and go on to the next slide here for me, Melissa. 
You can do so. Um, so first, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the administrative search. Uh, the use case for this is really around managing non-discoverable and withdrawn items. So these are item types that existed also in DSpace 6 and below, um, but non-discoverable items back in those old releases used to be called private items. We've renamed them here in DSpace 7 to make it clear what their purpose really is. So really, a non-discoverable item is an item that can only be found via a direct link. So someone can share you a direct link. You can go right to that item and see it easily, uh, but you won't be able to find it in the search or browse area of DSpace or even in OAI PMH. It's hidden other than be via that direct link. Um, we also do have withdrawn items. The same withdrawal processes exist within DSpace where you can take something down either temporarily or permanently. Withdrawing it makes it admin only, and you can make a decision then as to whether or not you want to reinstate it at a later date or keep it withdrawn or even delete it altogether. But administrative search allows you to get to both of these types of items very easily. So next slide, please. Here's a canned demo of that. It's over in your admin toolbar. It looks just like the normal search engine, but it has some extra filters here where we can quickly filter down to those non-discoverable items. You can make it discoverable right from within that search interface to allow you to uh, change that item's um, access restrictions or, or discoverability in this case. The same option exists for withdrawn items where you can filter down uh, to items that are currently withdrawn and you can reinstate it from there or you can withdraw any item from this admin interface. So it allows you a quick way to find a specific item in the system in order to do one of these administrative tasks on that item. Next slide here. Next, I'm going to talk about the batch metadata editing process. And this also existed in DSpace 6. Again, we've not uh, redesigned this in any way, shape, or form. We haven't changed how it functions in DSpace 7. It just looks different in the admin user interface. So you're going to see a somewhat new experience, but it's the same features that existed in DSpace 6, DSpace 5, even before that. And the main concept here is to allow you to do bulk editing or even bulk adding of metadata only items. And the process, as you may be familiar with, if you used old versions of DSpace, is you export item metadata to CSV. You can either do that from a collection or from a search results page. Uh, you edit that CSV and the metadata within there, and you upload the changed CSV in order to apply those updates to the items within DSpace. So we'll show a quick can demo here now. And this is the beginning of that process. So step one is exporting that CSV. I'm showing you how you can do it from a collection standpoint. It's from that admin side menu. This option is also available in search results. So you'll see it there if you have access to do this export. When you click on an export, it kicks off a new process to run the export for you behind the scenes. Um, and it may complete very quickly, like this one did if it was a small export, allowing you actually to download the CSV um, output here to your local system and be able to manage that and edit it. I'll let this play through again, just so you see where this is. So export metadata, you're selecting a collection to export from, um, and then kick off that process, which kicks a process off behind the scenes to, that does the actual export, and you can download the results of that process from that export page. So moving along, the second stage of this process here is then to modify that CSV. Uh, so this is documented in a great an amount of detail in the documentation. It's the same process that you've used in the past with DSP 6, 5, 4, uh, back when this was introduced. Don't recall exactly which release it was in, but basically you open up the CSV and, and your editor, Excel or other editors of CSVs, uh, you can modify the metadata there. You can add a new item by inserting a plus in the ID column, and that's what I'm showing here in the screenshot. I'm adding a brand new metadata-only item that has a title of this item is submitted from CSV, just to show off an example of how this might work. So you save those results to your local system, to the CSV, and then we're going to go through the next stage here of actually uploading that CSV into the system. So moving along here, this is the upload process now. It's just like that export, except now there's an import metadata. You can drag and drop your CSV or browse to it on your system. This is our edited file. Remember, we added a new metadata-only item here. There's a validate only option up there where you can just validate that it works and what the changes would be. It won't save anything. But in this case, I just uncheck that to allow it to save those results. And the, and the process here is running and the status of running, as you can see at the bottom. If I refresh the page, it goes to completed. 
and we can see what it has done in the system and what it found in your CSV and what changes were made. And in this case, I had shown an example of adding a new metadata only item to that collection we've uploaded into, and there's the item added right there in that collection. So um, again, it's just that same process. This is redoing that same demo, that, um, going through that item import, selecting it, and doing that import process. So that's the basics of batch metadata editing. And as you can see, it's very similar to the old approach um, in DSpace 6 and below. So moving along here to the next administrative feature. Now I'm gonna show you how a batch export and import work. And this is using the simple archive format. Again, this is a feature that existed in DSpace 6 and below. Um, and it allows you to uh, export both metadata and files into a zip file. So that last um, batch metadata editing only exports metadata into a CSV format and allows you to quickly update metadata or to add those metadata only items. This is a full export where you're getting not only metadata, but you're also getting the files associated with that metadata. So it can be used to migrate content from one DSpace to another or migrate content from one collection to another, or if you have an external system that you wanna to use to, to import into DSpace, this is a format you can do a bulk import into DSpace from. Um, I'm not gonna go through the, all the details of the simple archive format here, because it is the same simple archive format as in the past. Um, I do have a quick slide on that coming up, um, but it's, it's the same feature as you've seen in the past, it's just redone here in DSpace 7. So let's go through the process here of looking at how this looks in DSpace 7 now. This is the export process, so the batch export to zip. And in this case, you select a collection where you want to export all the items in that collection to a zip file. Um, and that zip file will be generated then again as a process. So it starts out in that running status there at the bottom. If you refresh the page, it ends up being completed and we're downloading the final um, uh, export file. And here I'm showing just what it looks like inside. You see the exported metadata files and the, this one has metadata and an actual document attached to it. Uh, this format is the same format as we've used in the past. So if you exported from an old DSpace 6, you could import that same format into DSpace 7, um, vice versa as well. Um, exporting out of DSpace 7, you could import into another DSpace 7 or even an older version of DSpace as well. So it's that same export format. Um, moving along here, so after you've exported a zip file, if you want to move along to the next slide, Melissa, I have a brief intro, uh, a note here on the simple archive format. So I showed this briefly in that CAN demo of that um, of those files inside a folder structure. Uh, this is a format that's existed in DSpace from almost the beginning of DSpace. It's just a way of getting content out of DSpace in a structured format. And one folder represents an item in this format. And each item folder has at least one metadata file and possibly content files. Um, the, the, all of the details of this export format exist in the documentation. The link is at the bottom there. But the general idea is you'll have XML files that represent the metadata. You'll see the exported content files themselves, whether they're like uh, Word or PDF or whatever in those folder structures. And each folder is a separate item. That's kind of the gist of, of what that structure looks like. And so now we're going to show an import process. So we exported, showed an export. Here we have a empty collection, and I'm going to show importing that same exported file into that collection. So in this case, we select what collection we're going to import into. So we're going to select that empty collection. You have that same validate only option where you can do a test or run the real thing. We're going to run the real thing and pull in our exported zip file. And it kicks off a process here again behind the scenes. Um, as soon as that process completes, we will see that the items that were in that zip file have now been added into that particular collection. So it extracts the files. There was only one item in this export. And if we go back to that collection, which was empty, we will now see the item um, as imported into that collection. And this is rerunning the CAN demo now at this point in time. 
So let's move along to the next. Um, as you saw in both of those, there's a new concept in DSpace 7 called processes. So you saw that each of those processes, that bulk export of metadata or the bulk export of the zip file, kicked off a process. It jumped you over to a process screen where you could see it was running or get to a completed status. You could see the output of that process and even the logs of that process. So this is a brand new concept in DSpace 7, and it allows you to run a lot of the commands that used to be on the command line, actually in the administrative user interface. And it's also used for a lot of these administrative um, editing commands as well to kick off those processes so they can run behind the scenes. And as an administrator in DSpace, you can easily see their status. If it's a long running process, it may take some time and you can go back and check on it. Um, if it's a very quick process, it completes almost immediately. And in both cases, you have the output files and the logs there to see what happened in that process in case it failed or something weird happened. Or if you just wanted to run that sort of test import process, you'd see the logs of what would have changed um, if you had actually run the full uh, import. So I'm going to show now here how you can interact with processes in the system. They're over there on that side menu. Again, there's a processes menu and you see everything you've run in the system here. You can see the import and export that I just demoed for you there. There's also a new button where you can kick off a new process and you have it all the the scripts available to you here, there's even scripts related to re-indexing, or in this case, the filter media script, which is used to generate thumbnails or do full text indexing. You can kick that off from the admin UI now. You no longer need to run it um, on the command line. Um, I'd still recommend scheduling it so it runs automatically occasionally on the command line. It's still possible to run there. But if you need to do a one-off quick run of that, you can do it from this processes menu and see the output of what occurred after running that, that command. Command. And so all these processes are manageable here. You can also delete old processes. That's useful if you want to get rid of uh, the old files that were associated with that process. If you do a really large batch upload, um, that batch upload zip file that you uploaded in is going to be kept in DSpace in that process until you go and delete the process. So after you've gone through the pro the um, uh, that upload and the process has completed and you're satisfied with the results, you might want to go into that um, processes page and delete those old processes. There's also a script that will automatically do that deletion for you that you can again schedule both from command line or run as its own process uh, to do some cleaning up of old process data in case you don't want to keep it around. And so that's how what processes look like within the admin menu. Moving along here. Um, one last thing I'm going to mention before we'll open it up to questions um, and also possibly uh, do live demos if there's any questions on specific features. Uh, there is a new health menu as well within DSpace 7. And this is really about allowing you to have access to a sort of control panel within the uh, user interface to see what's the status of everything running on the back end. If there's something going wrong or some weird behavior you're seeing, it can allow you a basic way to see, okay, something might be down or it's not connected properly or, or the DSpace UI can't connect uh, to this part of the back end or is not able to receive the results there or there's a notice there that you'll see in this health panel. You can also allow you to see the background back end configuration in case, again, in the same same scenario, if there's something weird, a weird behavior going on, you can quickly check from the admin user interface uh, if settings are as they as you expect them to be on the back end. So I'm going to show a very brief demo of that, and this will be our last uh, CAN demo here today. So the health panel, again, is over there on the side. In this case, you can see I have an alert on a status update. Most of my things are green checks, but I have an alert in one panel. I can open up that panel and see a notice that I'm missing the GeoLite database file, which means that my solar statistics can't generate location-based reports. So that gives you a notice that something's wrong on the back end. You can go and update that and fix that. You also are able to go over to the info section and see all the information that is able to be seen from the back end. So the version of Java, some basic configurations and things of that sort. Um, so that health panel is pretty new right now. There's not a whole lot of information there yet, but it's the starts to a more advanced control panel. I do expect there to be more and more features in that health panel as we go. And that's the last of our CAN demos for today's session. I did want to do a brief wrap up here. I know there are tons of questions as well. I did also allude to the fact that um, we could do some potentially uh, live demos if there are specific questions about specific areas. I have a um, 
a, a, a demo site up here on my local machine so I can share my screen here in a bit and we could walk through um, the user interface if there are specific questions that folks do have. Before I get into that, before I hand things back to you, Natalie, there's one extra slide here in the wrap up that I wanted to note. Uh, Melissa, if you want to move forward here, one more slide. Um, is just kind of a note to everybody here um, that we do have regular working group and interest groups if folks are interested in contributing back as individuals. If you're technical in any way, um, there's a development team meeting that's open to everybody every Thursday and we welcome anybody to join or you can contribute uh, by claiming tickets or working on things, get in touch with me if you have questions on that. If you're less technical and just interested in talking about DSpace or learning more about DSpace or brainstorming how do people use DSpace in this way, um, I'd recommend considering joining the DCAT meetings. Those happen monthly and the next one's coming up in mid-December here. And that's a great place for people who just manage a local DSpace to join and chat, chat with others about DSpace. And I think that is it. If you wanna move forward here, Melissa. So now we're gonna move into questions. And the last slide here as we're going into questions does have the link to this, um, this slide deck um, as well as our public Q&A doc. And I'm gonna turn things over here to Natalie so that she can kind of help us manage the uh, Q&A process here um, with, uh, with our uh, 500 uh, or so uh, uh, best friends uh, in this chat. <laughs> Go ahead, Natalie. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim and Melissa. Um, I think everyone's really happy with the event um, and we've gotten lots of questions. So they're sort of in two spots. And I just I'm lost so Natalie, you froze for a second there. Are you there? Yeah. yeah. I'm here. So we have questions in two two spots. There's that Q&A box um, that people have been putting some things in. And I've I've gone ahead and put the the ones that were um, asked in Spanish into the the other document for with with the translation. So I don't know if you want to start in the Q&A box and go ahead and, and, and answer those live and then we can switch over to the document. Sure, we can do that here. Let me see here. I'm pulling up the QA box here. Um, I did answer some of these as as uh, Melissa was was uh, talking. Okay. Um, the others that are open, though, um, let me see if there's some that I can answer quickly. Um, uh, I see some questions here about entities. Let me. Um, I'm going to share. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to um, steal the screen away from you, Melissa. If someone can copy these URLs into the chat um, for others, um, if they want to have the URLs to the slides, I'd appreciate that. Um, it's possible someone's yeah, already okay. done that, but mm -hmm. I'm going to steal away the screen so that I can use my um, local instance to show off some of these questions regarding entities because it may be easier to talk to a DSpace Seven instance here. Um, so what I'm showing here right now to you is this is a live uh, DSpace 7 installation on my local machine. Just a moment here. Let me make sure I'm up and running. Okay. So let's, uh, I'm going to log in as an administrative account uh, just to kind of move over to, um, to some of these questions around entities related to uh, moving old content into entities. So I'm seeing a lot of that. Um, around um, taking old um, papers that were in um, old, an old structure in DSpace 6. Can you move them over to DSpace 7 entities? I also see a question here around uh, what's the benefit of creating collections and communities uh, regarding entities? And I did want to kind of clarify a couple things regarding entities. Is first off, uh, Melissa mentioned this. Entities are an advanced feature right now. They're they're a little bit um, they're brand new is the way to the best say it. They're little, they're not experimental because they are stable, but we don't expect everybody to jump right into entities. We do feel that entities are going to be the future of DSpace, but because they are so new in DSpace 7, um, they are not, um, there's not a way to migrate old content from DSpace 6 into an entity in an automated bulk fashion yet. So that's the simple answer here is if you have old collections that are structured in a way um, that may uh, represent a journal um, 
uh, a, an entire journal volume issue structure, you cannot right now migrate that into DSpace entities, the corresponding entities. Um, instead, in DSpace 7, entities are there to, for you to create content um, in a much more easy fashion. I do expect there to be ways to do more of a bulk migration eventually as we build these tools out more. But right now, entities are more of a brand new feature to allow you to create new content that is structured um, without having to depend as much on the community collection um, uh, item hierarchy within DSpace. That said, one of the questions here was around uh, why would you have communities that are related to entities or collections related to entities? And the re reason there is that entities right now are items. And as Melissa pointed out, items need to belong to a collection. Um, that's how things have always existed within DSpace. That structure is still in DSpace 7. So items need to belong to a collection. And the reason for this structure um, and the reason for the fact that collections may even have uh, entity types, which is what um, uh, Melissa also shown, show off, or showed off, um, is that we want to be able to um, contain or create easy ways to build entities in DSpace and import entities into DSpace. Collections are the way are the are the thing that controls your import process. So if you remember back to DSpace six and five, this is the same behavior in DSpace seven that uh, collections define uh, what um, what submission what the submission process looks like, and so. Based on the type of collection, you can have a different submission view. And similarly, based on the type of entity, you're going to want to collect different metadata. So if we look at this, we have a collection that is a journal volume type. That's going to be tied to a journal volume submission form. And so it allows you to be able to uh, control things better in the import process. So if I show on my, my DSpace page, uh, Melissa showed importing. And you may have noticed here that importing has entity types once you've enabled entities. So these are imports that are specific to that entity type. Um, so if I collect, if I wanted to import a person entity, um, it only gives me systems that can import people. So in this case, ORCID is a, is a system that I can import a person entity from. Um, and if I search for myself here, keep in mind, this is a live demonstration. This could fail at any time, but it worked here. So. Uh, so it looks like uh, there's two Tim Donnies. I actually don't, don't remember, remember which, which one's, one's me, um, but I'm going to go ahead and import um, my ORCID uh, here and start off a new submission. So what this is doing is taking the metadata from ORCID to create a new person entity within DSpace. It tells me what collections in my DSpace support people entities. So uh, this is where that entity type comes into play. I have two collections here. I can just choose one um, based on where I want to import my person entity. And then I'm brought to a person entity form, which looks very similar to an item form, but you're going to notice things are slightly different. We have a first and last name field. Uh, we can capture an email address. We could even capture a birth date. These are all optional fields, but they're more specific to a person object. That they, they're not something you're going to see in an item object. Um, and you can, again, upload files if you wanted to, like an image or things of that nature. But it's it's similar, but, but different enough such that um, those collection types uh, really help you control what what form you want to um, import or what, what information you want to import. So if I went back and did the same sort of thing, this is a, a fresh import, not an import from an external system. I could start from a publication type. And then I get the collections that accept publications. And from there, I get a publication type form, which is going to look more like a traditional item form. So that's kind of how entities interact a little bit differently and why we still have that community and collection structure. Um, it is, again, these are very experimental features. I encourage people to try them out. If you're interested, I will talk more tomorrow in tomorrow's session about the upgrade process and how entities might not be for everybody yet. Um, it's uh, they're there for you they're for you if you want them, but you don't have to jump to them right away. You can still use DSpace in the traditional way. So that was a very long-winded um, explanation of several things I saw here re regarding entities. Um, I'm going to look through here some of these other questions. I'm not sure I understand the full context of a few of these. Uh, I see a question here about can a hyperlink URL be embedded in the abstract of an item? That is possible in DSpace 7 um, as of 7.4, I believe. So I have a sample collection here. 
that actually has an item here that has markdown and uh, math jacks format structured in it. So the abstract is actually displayed, displaying um, markdown and math jacks, and it also will display HTML. Um, so if I look at the abstract itself um, in the in the field and the description field, you can have line breaks. You can include uh, embedded math jacks content. You can even include um, HTML links uh, within that. So that is a feature that is a is a possible to enable within DSpace 7.4. Um, it's disabled by default, but it's in the um, user interface um, configuration. Uh, let's see. Is it possible to edit forms using the front end? In DSpace 6, you had to use an import forms.xml. Unfortunately, that is one of the things that is still on the back end. So there's still an XML file to edit those submission forms. Um, I would love to be able to see that get into the admin UI. And as you're seeing here in DSpace 7, we're trying to get more and more tools to the admin UI. It's not there yet, though. So um, it is still works in, the very, in a similar process to DSpace 6. And I see drag and dropping, does it deal with large files? It should. Um, I've tested it definitely with files over a gig. Um, I think it should work fine with even up to 10 gigs. If you get up to like a terabyte, that's where I'm, I'm not as sure how long the process will continue to run until um, something may time out on the back end, but it should work for large files. I would encourage you to test it locally. Give us feedback if you're noticing other behavior um, of that na nature. Um, do permissions still flow down? Meaning as an admin for the entire DSpace site, can I edit items within a collection that has separate assigned admins? Yes, permissions work the same in DSpace 7 as they did in DSpace 6. Um, so that is the exact same um, uh, functionality. I think what you'll find trying DSpace 7, if you used old versions of DSpace before, a lot of the features are structured in the same way. There are things may look different in the user interface, but we haven't ripped out the core of DSpace underneath. A lot of the core functionality under DSpace 7 is the same core functionality that existed in DSpace 6. So if we haven't told you it's changed, then it hasn't changed. It's the same functionality um, underneath. So a lot of this is should be very familiar to, if you've used DSpace before. Uh, let's see here. Are there... One question that Go ahead. a few times, um, so I think maybe we could just answer it. What is the latest stable version of DSpace 7? The latest DSpace 7 is DSpace 7.4. It just came out in October. Um, we will have a 7.5 release in February. I'll talk more about the release process tomorrow and the upgrading to DSpace 7 uh, uh, presentation, but, um, but we are doing a release every four months at this point in time. So 7.4 is the latest and greatest, um, and 7.5 is right around the corner. Um, I see a question here about when will Docker be fully supported? This is something I'm going to address a little bit tomorrow as well, but for those here, you can have a preview. Docker is fully supported in DSpace 7. Uh, there was a confusing way that we had worded the, the um, uh, the Docker um, scripts within the DSpace 7 doc, um, code base. We do have Docker scripts in DSpace 7. Those Docker scripts have been built for development. So I would not encourage you to use them exactly as is in production because you may want to lock them down more and perhaps close some of the ports because there's some development ports open there. Make them a little bit more secure. But you can use our scripts as the basis for for a Docker script to spin up DSpace 7. DSpace 7 can be run in Docker. I know there are many um, sites that already do run it in Docker. So I would encourage you to try that out. I would just recommend against using the scripts as is because of the fact that you're going to have some ports open that you don't want to have open in production scenarios. So you just want to kind of tweak those scripts slightly. Um, let's see here. Does an SAF import override existing files? Uh, by default, it will not um, uh, because that it works the same as in DSpace 6 in terms of an SAF import. I believe there's a way that you can use um, map files. I forget. Yeah, the terminology of map file, it's the same as in DSpace 6. If you had a map file in the SAF import, there's a, there's a flag you could use to actually allow you to overwrite 
files and edit them using the SAF import, but by default it's importing a brand new object. Um, so I checked the documentation there, but it, it works the exact same as it did in DSpace 6 and below. Um, creating custom entities from the web interface, there is not a way to do that from the web interface. Entities right now are structured in um, an XML file that um, helps create them in the database. They're actually in the database when they're, where they're living. Um, because entities are a brand new feature and, and advanced, um, I would not recommend um, creating a whole lot of brand new custom entities at this time because I do feel like uh, entities of the future of DSpace, I think in DSpace 8, we're going to start to see entities more ingrained in the system. Um, the plans for DSpace 8 are, are a little bit unfinalized at this point in time, but I would recommend um, trying to stick with the default entities for now. If you want to create a couple custom ones, you could do so, but just be aware that um, because DSpace 8 is not fully planned out, it could be possible that you will eventually want to migrate your custom entities into whatever's available within DSpace 8. So just a note of caution there, but it is possible to create custom entities. Just be, be careful with that. It is definitely very advanced. Uh, let's see. Trying to see what other things are easy to um, answer here in a live session. And I'm only looking at the Q&A document here right now. I will note, Natalie, if there's stuff going in on, or not, I'm looking at the Q&A within the um, webinar here. I'm not looking at the Q&A document um, separately yeah. yet. Um, there were a bunch of questions, and I don't know if this might be for tomorrow, um, about importing metadata um for the like migrating the metadata and importing metadata through csv files um i think there there's some concerns about that um just trying and i'm just looking in the the document here um see. yeah i may need more context on that so there is the csv import that i showed off um that comes in over here from import metadata from CSV. You can use that to import metadata. That's one way to get metadata files in. There's also the import process that Melissa showed off here. Um, this little import link in your MyDSpace allows you to import from those external sources. And there's a variety of those right now. So we have PubMed, Archive, Crossref, Scopus. Um, a lot of these are hooked into DSpace by default. And when you select one, you're doing a live search against their API. So when I select PubMed and I actually do search, I'm just gonna put in a generic term, this is a live search against PubMed and pulling me down the top results based on my search. Um, and this does allow you to quickly import content and all the metadata, or not the content, the metadata directly from those external sites. So that's one way to get stuff in very quickly. And then uh, a few people asked about being able to import data from public access catalogs, for example, ALIF, um, is that a feature? That is not here right now. We do have, uh, we are constantly adding more of these import sources. So these import sources have to be coded individually. Um, they're not um, extremely easy to add at all times, but we are constantly adding them. And we start out with a list that was probably in about three or four um, in seven dot Four, I believe, and it was 7.3, we added an extra 10 to that list. We are constantly um, adding more external sources. Um, so it's possible things will come up in that area. We also do always take community contributions. So if you have anybody technical at your institution and they want to write us um, the code to allow an import from a specific um, external source or external API, um, we would gladly accept that code, take a look at it, try and get it into the next release of DSpace. So this is an area that others can um, collaborate and help us build out this list uh, to support even more um, external sources. And I did see a quick question here on international UI. I, um, that's something we didn't show off here. There's a little globe up here. 
um, that has many different translations of DSpace 7. These are all provided by community members. So if you don't see your language here, um, you can provide us with a translation of the user interface. But when I select one of the other languages here, the user interface, um, at least the key terms here will change to that language. You see my results list did not change. Um, but if I go browse back to the home page, um, you'll see that the headers here are changing into uh, Spanish language, um, which is what I happen to select in that case. Um, so I've got uh, Spanish language terms. And we have a variety here, about approximately 20 so far. Uh, but we do accept others um, from others in the community. Just send the translations our way, and we'll get them in as soon as possible into the next release. And uh, Tim, there were a bunch of questions related to statistics. So um, in the other document, I'm just, hold on one second. Um, how do you generate, use, and download statistics? What are the main differences between this? And have alt metrics, usage statistics, and reports been improved in the new version? And lastly, did you talk about statistics? Uh, yeah, we don't have alt metrics support at this point in time. The statistics in DSpace 7 are pretty simple, and they're kind of in line with what existed in DSpace 6. Um, that's something I can't actually easily show up in my little local instance because they the statistics don't work on local host URLs. Uh, but if I open up the demo site, we have demo7.dspace.org. If it's going to be responsive for me, um, there is a statistics. It's having some time loading here. Um, so uh, so there are basic statistics. In this case, it's showing the, the total visits, the top visits um, for items. If you browse to a community or collection, it looks like our demo site's acting a little bit slow, but I'm just going to guess on where to go. If I browse to like a community here, the statistics will be specific to that community now. A same at a collection level or an item level. Um, that statistics men menu will provide you basic usage uh, for the community collection and item um, or the site-wide. Um, those reports are extremely basic at this point in time, but there has there's several tickets already in um, our to-do list around trying to make some enhancements around statistics and both uh, bring them up to the same type of statistics that were in DSpace 6, as well as enhance them further. So I do think this is an area that will be worked on much more in the future. Um, at this point in time, it's pretty basic. Um, again, I would welcome folks who are very passionate about statistics that uh, we do always take contributions here. If you're interested in helping out in this space, get in touch with me, um, and I can show you some of the tickets that we already have available. You can also create additional uh, tickets around work you'd like to do. So please get in touch if that's of interest to you. Um, let's see. We've got a lot of activity, lots of questions. Love to see all this. I know we only have about seven minutes left. So before I dive into other questions, I do want to note here. Um, Natalie is going to be copying the Q&A out of our um, chat within Zoom here into that uh, Q&A document that we shared earlier um, in the slide deck. That Q&A document, I'm going to make sure questions get answered there, even if it takes me a long time <laughs> to, to get to it. Those questions will get answered um, over the next uh, approximately you know, couple days or a week. We'll get answers for you, um, as long as I understand the context of the question. So if you ask a question in there, there may be cases where if I don't understand exactly what you're asking, I might ask a question back to you. So please keep an eye there. Um, if you ask a question, um, we can start a discussion there and make sure that you get the answers you need. And I'll try and also link folks to documentation that may be useful if there's a question that is already documented somewhere else. Um, and again, that, that um, set of slides I'm talking about, or that document I'm talking about is uh, this Q&A document here at the bottom. That's where I will ensure that your questions get answered. And as always, the workshop slides are immediately available here. Um, go ahead, Natalie. If you um, added a question to the Q&A box in Spanish, um, I, I copied that into the Q&A document um, that's in the link um, and translated it so that Tim can answer it. So it's not that we ignored your question. It's just that uh, we were handling it that way. 
And I do see one other question I'm going to answer here real quick is about ORCID profile as a person. Was that a live link to the ORCID profile? Um, there's two ways to import from ORCID. Um, so uh, the way that I first showed was on my local machine here, um, the MyD space. If I'm doing an import of a person here, uh, a person object from ORCID, this is a, a more static one-time import. So I'm importing it one time. It is not connected up to ORCID over, overall. It's just a one-time import. So that's one way of importing from ORCID. It's a way to get people from ORCID really quickly. The other way of importing from ORCID, um, and I'm, this is where I have to jump to the demo site because it doesn't work on my local host right now, is through this login uh, link here. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to show a full um, example of this. Let's see. Yeah, I don't have a, a sign in here I can use um, that's remembered in my current browser. But essentially, uh, what we've implemented here in DSpace 7, there's a brand new feature in DSpace 7 that when you log in through ORCID, if you have entities enabled within your DSpace 7 site and you do that login through ORCID, you can actually uh, create have ORCID uh, sync down to a person entity that represents you. It's called a, a researcher profile within DSpace, and that does create a link between your ORCID profile and your researcher profile, which happens to be a person entity between those. And so it, you can set it up to sync. It'll sync your data. And so if you update your local uh, researcher profile within DSpace, if you link up new publications to it within DSpace, you can tell it to push those up to your ORCID profile. Um, and so that is a more tight link to ORCID. Uh, it does require enabling entities. And that's something I'm going to mention again tomorrow is that that's one of the use cases where folks might really want to turn on entities if just for that feature, if you really want to have that sync with ORCID and that's important to your institution, you can turn on entities and only use them for that if you want, um, or you could use them in other ways as well. If that sync to ORCID is not of interest, you don't need to, to turn on entities necessarily. But I did want to kind of clarify that. And I see we're, we're very low on time here. Uh, so we may want to get towards our final wrap up here. We only see about three minutes left. Um, I guess, is there anything else you wanted to add here, Natalie, before we wrap up? I want to give us time to, to do a quick wrap up. Uh, no, that just that all the questions that were in the chat box on Zoom have been added to the document, so nothing will get lost there. And just muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí con nosotros hoy y nos vemos mañana para el próximo evento. Yes, and thank you all. Uh, it's been great um, having this session. Uh, thanks to Melissa as well. Um, I hope you all found this extremely useful. I saw we had over 500 people at one point in time, so great attendance. And uh, get those questions in for us, and uh, we'll do our best to get them all answered. So thank you all. Thanks, everyone. And JR, Jen, if you want to stop the recording now.